ecological viewpoint that Herbert presents us with in Dune begins with the arrival of the Atreides on the planet Arrakis as they begin to undertake control of the production of Melange for the Emperor Shaddam IV. Up until this time, the Harkonnens have governed the world, holding the planet in quasi-fife under a Chum Company contract to mine the geriatric spice Melange. The world of Arrakis is a polarised change for the Atreides, who come from a planet called Caladan, opposite in many ways to their new home, being rich in the natural resources of water, oceans and seas. This is a stark contrast to Arrakis, a world where there is no precipitation and where water is so scarce that its conservation is paramount to survival and where its ownership is even used to indicate an individual's wealth. It is interesting to note that as we follow the story of Dune throughout the several thousand years in which it takes place, we see the planet Arrakis go through several severe ecological transformations. At first it is a desert planet, with few places where human beings can seemingly survive before being slowly transformed by Paul Moadib Atreides and later to a greater extent by the Atreides regent, Alia. This transformation begins to destroy the desert regions in favour of more verdant and lush areas that are increasingly suitable for sustaining life. Over the next three and a half thousand years, Leto II has totally transformed the world to such an extent that Arrakis has become an Eden-like planet, with only one small desert remaining at the Emperor's Sarir. With the death of Leto II and the reintroduction of the Sand Trout Vectors, Arrakis once again returns to a desert world as the giant worms are slowly repopulated and the returning sand trout insist all surface water. Eventually the planet Arrakis is destroyed by the Honoured Matres using their obliterators, and the world succumbs to the machinations of those who seek to control the spice melange. Arrakis was once very ecologically different to when we first see it with the arrival of House Atreides in the year 10191. Prior to this, some time in the distant past not alluded to specifically, the planet was a wet world with a very different ecosystem to the one it later developed. Only once are we given any indication as to what caused the vast changes that transformed the planet from a world of oceans to a world of deserts. In Children of Dune, Leto II reveals what occurred to his twin sister Ganema as he probes his other memory. Yet water had been known here in prehistoric times. White gypsum pans attested to bygone lakes and seas, wells deep drilled found water which sand trout sealed off. As clearly as if he'd witnessed the events, he saw what had happened on this planet and it filled him with foreboding for the cataclysmic changes which human intervention was bringing. His voice barely above a whisper, he said, I know what happened, Ganema. She bent close to him. Yes? The sand trout. He fell silent and she wondered why he kept referring to the haploid phase of the planet's giant sandworm, but she dared not prod him. The sand trout, he repeated, was introduced here from some other place. This was a wet planet then. They proliferated beyond the capability of existing ecosystems to deal with them. Sand trout insisted the available free water made this a desert planet, and they did it to survive. In a planet sufficiently dry, they could move to their sandworm phase. The sandworms, and more importantly the sand trout vector that is part of their life cycle, are not indigenous to Arrakis, though no suggestion is ever provided as to their origins. Like most species on Arrakis, they have at some stage been brought there, though the majority of other species introduced to the planet have been done so after the desertification of the world by the sand trout. The relationship between the sandworms, the desert, water and melange is vital to understanding the ecology of Arrakis. It is the introduction of the sand trout or little makers stage of the sandworm life cycle that brought about the destruction of Arrakis's original ecosystems and began the process of transforming the world into the desert planet called Dune. Few seem to understand the nature of the transformation process or the relationship between the worms and the spice, with perhaps the exception of Leotkines and the Fremen. The sand trout are known as little makers, 
and described as the half plant, half animal, deep sand vector of the Arrakis sandworm. The little maker's excretions form the pre spice mass. Their initial introduction to the world of Arrakis is never speculated on by Herbert, and remains one of the novel's unsolved mysteries. Their impact upon the world of Arrakis is however ecologically catastrophic to the planet's original environment, and is synonymous with similar environmental catastrophes involving introduced species. An obvious example was the introduction of the cane toad Bufo Marinus in Australia from the 1930s onwards, in order to deal with an indigenous species of the cane beetle Dermolepida albohirtum. The cane toads developed exponentially in the northeastern regions of Australia, where they have no major natural predators. As a result, they have become one of the country's biggest pests and a huge threat to the biodiversity of Australia. Another such example is the creature that Frank Herbert most likely based his sand trout and sandworms upon, namely the sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus. The sea lamprey has become a major problem in the Great Lakes region of the USA and Canada, where they have decimated local fish populations. The sea lamprey not only bears a remarkable physical similarity to Herbert's sandworms, but its life cycle is in itself not altogether dissimilar. Now they had the circular relationship. Little maker to pre-spice mass. Little maker to shy halud. Shy halud to scatter the spice upon which fed microscopic creatures called sand plankton. The sand plankton, food for shy halud, growing, burrowing, becoming little makers. The similarity of the sandworm life cycle to that of the sea lamprey is also comparable when we consider Herbert's viewpoint of the desert sands being similar to oceans and their movement being governed by fluid mechanics. In particular the sea lamprey's sedentary stage is compatible to the sand trout stage of metamorphosis as it enters into a period of hibernation to emerge as a small worm after five to six years. The sand trout stage of the sandworm life cycle is inevitably drawn towards water, which they close off, absorbing it wherever they find it. For what purpose is somewhat a mystery, but as the sand trout goes through this process, creating the pre-spice mass through its excretions and ultimately melange and sand plankton, they are unable to proceed to the final stage of their life cycle whilst large bodies of water remain. The latter stage of their life cycle, the sandworm, has a fatal aversion to water and the sand trout do not begin the process of transformation until all such water is gone. The Fremen use the stunted form of sandworm to create the poisonous water of life, which they obtain by drowning the creature in water. It is through this powerful awareness spectrum narcotic that they are able to create their own reverend mothers and through their transmutation of the drug into a safer form, the siege orgies that are ritualistically performed by the Fremen are able to occur. Again here is an example of the Fremen interaction with their ecosystem which is incorporated into their religious, social and sexual practices. The life cycle of the sandworm then, in order to reach its culmination, must by necessity transform the planet they are introduced to into a barren desert wasteland devoid of almost all water. Various factions try to break the monopoly that Arrakis has on melange production by attempting to capture and transplant the worms to other planets. This always fails with the death of the transplanted worms, usually because they are introduced to pre-existing desert regions. It highlights the failure by almost everyone to fully understand the relationship between the worms life cycle and their environment, though it shows at least an acknowledgement of a suspected relationship between the worms and the spice. In addition to the destruction of water on the planet Arrakis, the sandworms perform one very important function. Many plant species once native to Arrakis become extinct after the arrival of the sand trout on the planet, and those few that survived and later transplanted were excellently adapted to survive in such a harsh environment. But with so few plants on Arrakis, the question arises as to where the near perfect oxygen nitrogen carbon dioxide mix comes from. This mystery, the obvious gap in the planet's ecosystem, was apparent to Pardo Kynes, the planet's imperial ecologist, 
it is the worms themselves that fill this obvious ecological gap, doing so via their internal digestive factory with its enormous concentrations of aldehydes and acids, a giant source of oxygen. Pardot notes that a medium-sized worm of about 200 metres in length is capable of putting into the atmosphere as much oxygen as 10 square kilometres of green growing photosynthesis surface. When cast out in the desert to die by the Harkonnens, Liatkinds recalls his father's words. The Arakeen environment built itself into the evolutionary pattern of native life forms, his father said. How strange that so few people ever looked up from the spice long enough to wonder at the near ideal nitrogen oxygen CO2 balance being maintained here in the absence of large areas of plant cover. The energy sphere of the planet is there to see and understand. A relentless process, but a process nonetheless. There is a gap in it. Then something occupies that gap. Science is made up of so many things that appear obvious after they are explained. I knew the little maker was there, deep in the sand, long before I ever saw it. Adam Roberts sees this as representative of the sketchy and error-filled representation of Dune's extreme environment, as he questions how oxygen is produced on Arrakis. He points out that Herbert suggests that the sandworms fart oxygen, which hardly addresses the problem. But I would add that Herbert is suggesting that the digestive factories of the worms is presented as an alien alternative to the creation of the nitrogen-oxygen CO2 balance, which would be maintained by large areas of plant life. Nevertheless, I would agree with David M. Lawrence, who, when discussing the ecology of Arrakis in relation to its massive sandstorms, points out that readers of science fiction and fantasy are expected to suspend disbelief. Disbelief is required when Herbert described the sandstorms that raged across the surface of Arrakis. The sandworms are enormous in size, with some growing longer than 400 metres in length, with Paul noting at one point that I've seen space frigates that were smaller. The Atreides first encounter a worm when being given a tour of a spice mining operation in the desert. As they observe from their ornithopter, Duke Leto is the first to spot worm sign. The telltale warnings that a worm is on its way to devour the harvester factory, which mines the spice. As the Duke points to the worm sign, Paul sees the crescent dune tracks spread shadow ripples towards the horizon and, running through them as a level line stretching into the distance, came an elongated mount in motion, a cresting of sand, and notes how it reminds him of a large fish swimming just below the surface. The nature of the worms themselves as territorial creatures means that they defend the spice grounds which are mined by the harvesters. The worms are attracted to vibrations created by the mining process, and aerial spotters and seismic probes are deployed to constantly keep vigil for worm sign. Once worm sign is spotted, a carryall descends to the surface where it lifts the harvester away to safety. When the Atreides first encounter a worm at a spice mining facility, they are forced to evacuate the harvester's crew as the Harkonnen have sabotaged the carryall. The giant worm arrives and consumes the entire factory. The vibrations that attract the sandworms also mean that the use of Holtzman shields on Arrakis is often very quickly fatal to those who use them, as they completely enrage the sandworms. When asked about the use of shields, Kynes points out, Activate a shield within the worm zone and you seal your fate. Worms ignore territory lines, come from far around to attack a shield. No man wearing a shield has ever survived such attack. The worms are incredibly tough and resistant to most weaponry. The exception being water, which is fatal to them, and something that Kynes fails to mention to the Duke and his staff. High voltage electrical shock applied separately to each ring segment is the only known way of killing and preserving an entire worm, Kynes said. They can be stunned and shattered by explosives, but each ring segment has a life of its own. Barring atomics, I know of no explosive powerful enough to destroy a large worm entirely. They're incredibly tough. Why hasn't an effort been made to wipe them out? Paul asked. Too expensive, Kynes said. Too much area to cover. Paul leaned back in his corner. His truth sense 
Awareness of tone shadings told him that Kynes was lying and telling half-truths, and he thought, if there's a relationship between spice and worms, killing the worms would destroy the spice. The initial encounter with the worm is not as up close and personal as the next time Paul encounters one, fleeing with his mother into the deep desert from the Harkonnen. At this point, Paul and Jessica are surviving, using what knowledge they have of Arrakis and wearing still suits and other frame kit equipment left for them. In an attempt to reach the safety of rock, they plant a thumper, a piece of equipment used to attract a worm when crossing open desert. The thumper sets a continual series of noises in motion that attracts a worm to its location, and here, its use by Paul and his mother nearly results in their death. When a worm encounters a thumper, they usually devour it, and once this has happened, the creature heads towards the two fugitives. They only escape because the Fremen, who have been secretly observing them, set another thumper in action. The Fremen use the thumper to summon worms in order to use them to travel upon for long distances across the desert, with the use of maker hooks, which they use for capturing, mounting, and steering the worms. Understanding the nature of the worms has allowed them to travel in relative safety across the desert sands between sieges, and the Fremen, when travelling on foot, do so by walking without rhythm, so that they sound like the natural shifting of sand, like the wind. The only sounds that the sandworms tend not to investigate are those that appear to have a natural origin. Paul and Jessica survive the encounter with the worm, and have a precarious meeting with the Fremen led by Stilgar, but not before Paul is able to experience the worm's presence at a very short distance. He found himself registering every available aspect of the thing that lifted from the sand there seeking him. Its mouth was some 80 metres in diameter, crystal teeth with the curved shape of Chris knives glinting around the rim, the bellows breath of cinnamon, subtle aldehydes, acids. The worm blotted out the moonlight as it brushed the rocks above them, a shower of small stones and sand cascaded into the narrow hiding place. Paul crowded his mother farther back. Cinnamon! The smell of it flooded across him. What has the worm to do with the spice melange? He asked himself, and he remembered Liat Kynes betraying a veiled reference to some association between worm and spice. <laughs>